Good afternoon. My name is Shane Seibarton. Today I'm going to tell you about next generation superconducting quantum interference devices from high temperature superconductors. I'd like to get started with a little bit of history and background of superconducting devices. The beginning started with a groundbreaking paper by Brian Josephson from the Cavendish lab over in Cambridge. And he predicted that superconducting electrons could tunnel through thin insulators when they're sandwiched between two superconducting electrodes. Ford Motor Company used this um, technology to develop something called the SQUID, which is a quantum interference device where the currents in the different junctions can interfere with one another in, at very high resolution with sensitivity to magnetic field. The SQUID sensor combines two Josephson junctions onto a superconducting loop and we can put voltage leads across the terminals. And as magnetic field is changes inside of the loop, we get an oscillatory voltage with the period of the flux quantum. And very sensitive magnetometers can be developed using this technique. Squid sensors have the highest sensitivity of any sensor. Recently, PTB demonstrated squid sensors with noise levels as low as 150 attotesla. They also have a very large sensor bandwidth from DC all the way up to terahertz. The first MEG use of squids was done by David Cohen at MIT with one of Zimmerman's squids. And this evolved over several decades into the modern systems that we all know of today, like the electrotriacs. However, there's a lot of challenges with these squids um, because they operate at low temperature. The cost of liquid helium is, is a, makes these systems very expensive to operate. And also there's a lot of thick insulation inside the system to keep the cooling temperature low. And this translates to a very large signal to sensor distance because you have a lot of insulation between your head and the sensor. Furthermore, the, the doers that contain the, the liquid helium are rigid. So the helmets that go over the head um, are all typically one sized and for smaller patients, the squid sensor becomes much further away from the sensor as a patient with a head that fits correctly in the helmet. Innovation was made in, in superconducting materials in the late 80s by a, a group led by Paul Chu and uh, M.K. Wu. And when they discovered superconductivity above 77 Kelvin in ceramic materials, People thought that these would replace all of the low temperature squids that we have, but they haven't. Even today, all the MEG systems use niobium still. And the reason for that is because these high temperature superconductors bring a whole set of new challenges to the devices. They're very complex oxide ceramic materials, as you can see from this crystal structure here. And in this structure, the resistivity and the superconductivity, all the electrical properties vary depending on which axis you look down. So it's different along A than B than C. Furthermore, in order to superconduct, these crystals have to be epitaxial or perfectly aligned. Whereas in niobium, the atoms are more amorphous in disorder. This requires that planar geometries are used where the currents move through the Josephson junctions inside the AB plane. And that really makes other challenges in the design and layouts. And also, researchers typically force these devices to operate at 77 Kelvin because that's the boiling point of liquid nitrogen. But the TC is just 90 Kelvin, and that's too close to that. And I'll talk more about that as at the end of my talk. Furthermore, the, perhaps the biggest problem with high TC devices currently is the large amounts of intrinsic noise that comes from grain boundaries and material defects. But for all squids, one thing that we do know is if we wanna lower the noise, we need to be able to control the resistance, the intrinsic resistance, so that we can get larger signal to noise ratios. Now I'm gonna switch gears and talk about what my group is doing different in high temperature superconductors and nanowires and what's the real innovation here is now. We use a different approach to make high TC junctions than other people and we use something called the superconductor insulator transition, which is an intrinsic property that's unique to high temperature superconducting ceramics. This plot shows the resistivity as a function of temperature for a YBCO sample that was irradiated with different doses of ions. 
At the bottom, you see the unirradiated film, which is the low resistive, uh, high temperature superconductor with the 90 Kelvin uh, TC. And as you increase the disorder from the irradiation, what you see is that the resistivity increases in a systematic way and the superconducting transition temperature decreases. At very high doses, the material is converted from a superconductor to an insulator. Early on, researchers proposed that, hey, we could use this to make Josephson junctions if we can make that insulator small enough. So the people have developed masking techniques and other technologies to try to create ion damaged regions where they could behave as Josephson barriers. Unfortunately, the resolution of those techniques was only about 20 nanometers, and we really need something of the order of two or three nanometers. My group found a way to do this. In 2004, Carl Zeiss with the, a, a few other research groups developed the Orion helium ion beam system. And this system is, uses helium or neon to create a focused ion source that's much higher resolution than any other ion beam system that's in the market. It can focus the source all the way down to just half a nanometer. And my group showed that it can routinely create sub 10 nanometer features in YBCO which are crucial for high quality Josephson tunneling. Here's an example of some of those first devices that we made in collaboration with Carl Zeiss. The upper set shows the current voltage characteristics for a metallic barrier type squid, whereas the bottom curve shows a set of voltage characteristics for an insulating barrier squid. This was the first demonstration of an insulating barrier Josephson junction in all high TC materials. And the, the big takeaway from this is, is we had a way now to tune the resistance of the Josephson junction by just controlling the amount of dose that we put into the sample. And here we show that. So over here, these Josephson junctions have metallic behavior, like most conventional high TC junctions, where these junctions have that insulating behavior. And that really tells you with confidence that we're making two nanometer or so features inside the devices. After those initial experiments, I bought that helium ion microscope and brought it to Riverside. My students and I have been working on um, improving the junctions. And here's a, a set of nearly ideal current voltage characteristics for a high TC insulating barrier junction. It, it ranges all the way from 53 Kelvin down to four and a half Kelvin with nearly ideal characteristics. A second innovation that we came up with is called direct right nanowires. And direct right nanowires is another problem that we solved in high TC superconductors that limited the feature size. Most conventional high TC devices don't have any feature sizes less than about two to, to three microns. And this is a challenge because as you try to pattern the material smaller, the oxygen runs out and the material doesn't superconduct anymore. The same process of the ion damage also will disorder the material. So what we developed is an approach to create nanowires in the material by using the same beam that we use to make the Josephson junction here to irradiate the side banks. And what this does is this shrinks down the conductor into a nanofilament and gives us extremely tunable characteristics for our Josephson junctions. This slide demonstrates that. It shows the current voltage characteristics for a four micron device, two micron, one micron, all the way down to 50 nanometers. So we're scaling that size of that junction all the way down to 50 nanometer. Over here, we can plot the, how the critical current is changing of the device as we scale down, and it's perfectly linear with the dimension, ensuring us that we are scaling it down like we think we are. Furthermore, the normal state resistance is going up as we expect as well. And this gives us a way now to tune the different amounts that we have of IC and RN to optimize the squid for noise and performance. Now I'm gonna show some of the example circuits that my group has already demonstrated and been making using this new technology. This is a sensor that contains six different squid magnetometers inside of a very small region. Each sensor is smaller than 150 microns across, so that's about the size of the width of a human hair. If I zoom in on one of those devices, I'll show you how it works. The squid actually lives inside of this center electrode. 
The hexagonal loop that you see is a flux concentrator made to increase the sensitivity. First, we start by using helium irradiation to create the slit, which is gonna pass the flux and that's gonna be where the squid lives. No materials removed or etched, we're just converting it to an insulator. Then we use a lower dose of irradiation to create two Josephson junctions near the bottom. If there's a, a flux inside of the squid, it creates a circulating current around the device shown in blue, and that is the actual squid. However, this other loop that we put in called the flux concentrator, if there's a flux that goes through it, it creates a circulating current which is forced to go around the squid because of the resistance of the junctions. And this is called a directly coupled magnetometer. And because we can control that resistance, we see very large 80 microvolt voltages out of these devices for very narrow 100 nanotesla magnetic field. The noise properties of this device have a floor at about one picotesla, which is an excellent number for a device that's only 100 microns. We scaled these devices even further, and we wanted to scale them down to the nanoscale for more sensitivity and to work on building together chains of arrays to increase signal to noise ratio of these sensors. And we use the exact same approach. Here, in white, in figure B, it shows where we create insulating lines in a YBCO structure. The hole in the center, that's the squid hole, and a coupling current can be passed very closely to the side of the squid. And it becomes very strongly coupled because as you know, the magnetic field falls off as one over R squared. So the closer you can get that current, the, the better the sensor will be. We also trim down the squid to force these resistances to go up and be much higher. Figure C shows a helium ion micrograph where it's an actual device and the dark regions represent insulating areas in the squid. So it's very reproducible and very exact to whatever you pattern. Here I show the current voltage characteristics from 4.2 Kelvin to 54 Kelvin for one of these devices with an extremely high resistance of 32 ohms. This is close enough to match to room temperature electronics without any matching networks or transformers. This is also a way to increase the signal to noise ratio. Furthermore, that resistance doesn't change over the entire temperature range. So it works over 50 Kelvin range with zero change in, in resistance because we were able to tune it. The voltage properties of the squid are shown over here where we show these whopping 500 microvolt voltages at the lowest temperatures, but even large voltages of 30 microvolts and consistent with other high TC squids. The bottom pane shows that it's very accessible to that control current by passing it very close to the device. So the next step in this type of research is, can we couple this to a pickup coil and use this type of device to get more signal out of the squid? We're currently also working on, can we chain these nano squids together? By chaining many squids together, one can imagine you could do signal averaging between the different devices to drop the noise lower and pull the signal out, just like a spectrum analyzer would work. Furthermore, by chaining them together, you get much higher voltage. And here shows a series array of three squids with a one millivolt voltage. For my last section, I'm going to briefly talk about new cooling solutions that need to be done to really make HTS transfer into good technology. And first off, I want to convince you that they shouldn't be operated at 77 Kelvin. It's much easier to engineer better cryogenic cooling systems than to engineer the squid to be different. This shows the energy gap or the figure of merit of a squid as a function of temperature. As you can see, it's a very steep curve over by TC. At 77 Kelvin, which I highlight with the black line, the curve is almost at its steepest. So any small temperature fluctuation is gonna cause that figure of merit or the values of the squid to fluctuate. And this also will generate noise. Furthermore, at 77 Kelvin, you'll see that this line, which represents the critical current or the amount of supercurrent in the squid, is 
more than half. So you're actually, you're kind of sacrificing squid performance for the ease of cooling. And it, and it should be the other way around. Also at lower temperature or at higher temperature, you have higher KBT noise. So to get to these smaller temperatures, there's other uh, solutions that are available. One could be Joule Thompson coolers, such as uh, the ones that I show here from MMR Tech. Using these sensors at, uh, with liquid nitrogen, you could hit 70 Kelvin, whereas with neon, it would be 20 Kelvin. Or more recently, um, solid cryogens are something that my group has been working on with Tristan Technologies, um, which is a technology originally developed by NASA for space applications. And it's beneficial because it's vibration free. When you have liquid cryogens, it vibrates the system around creating additional noise. And you get longer hold time out of solid cryogens because there's a latent heat of the phase transition that can hold the energy. And you can see here for some of these small doers that we've tested, we're able to see solid cryogen cooling last for hours and have a, a lot of cooling power. And I'll lastly leave you with a, a design that was uh, proposed by Yoshio Okada of how to make a small doer that could hold an individual sensor of about 20 millimeter diameter. And I could envision using this with si solid cryogens to cool these sensors. And with that, I'd like to thank my group and all the students that have contributed to this work. And of course, all the folks that keep the bills paid. Thank you for your attention.